Okay, um, so tonight we have a few guests. We have the League of Women Voters, we have the Horn Campaign, and we also have City Council Campaign. Um, Lauren, uh, Lauren Rizell is running for City Council Ward 2. So he's here tonight to talk about his campaign um, as well. So I am going to turn it over to Connie from the League of Women Voters. Um, you guys will please help me welcome her to the stage. Yeah, sure can. I mean, I, I'll say I can. Oh no, I've destroyed it. No, 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 it's okay. I already did that. Yeah. Did you have another piece? Oh. There we go. Yeah. We may need to put it a little higher, is that okay? okay. Yeah, you can. No. Okay. And Rebecca, I can't get this to do speaker. Oh my goodness. You may have to hold it. Just hold it like this. Like yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Rebecca, I can't do this. Run it. I don't know. Don't just do like you did me. Put it on speaker. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> You can go ahead. Just yeah. ignore me. I'm just okay. going to mess with this for a okay. second. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's right. So I'm Connie Malloy with the League of Women Voters, and I'm just going to do a brief um, overview of what we do. And um, I'm going to start with a little history, just a little bit of history about how we got started. Um, it was a long time ago. I'd like, I, I, don't, I don't think you can see this, but this is the woman holding up a banner. It says, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Um, so back when, the effort, back when the effort started for women to get the right to vote, um, it all began, as many of you probably already know this, um, from the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, and that was in 1848. It launched the movement to ratify the, the 19th Amendment of the Constitution in 1920, so over 70 years of work. And sometimes I think about that when I get discouraged and want things to happen more quickly than they ever do. It takes a long time for change to happen. The suffragists were tough, dauntless, dogged, and determined, and they had to be. As Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Truer words, and they still apply today. The League was organized just after women got the right to vote and has been going and going strong ever since. Our common goal is working to educate, encourage, and support our citizens as they exercise their right to take part in the political process. We are a nonpartisan political organization operating on the national state and local level. We never lend our support to an individual candidate or a political party. However, after careful study by our membership and consensus, we do sometimes take a position on an issue. There are leagues in every state in the US and in the District of Columbia. And Oklahoma is home to five other local leagues. They're in Oklahoma County, Lawton, Norman, Stillwater, and Tulsa. And we all work under the state wing of Oklahoma. All leagues actively encourage informed participation in the democratic process and increased understanding of that process as well as policy issues. Our local league is one of the first in Oklahoma. 
I found records going back to 1967, but I'm pretty sure it started before that. Maybe someone else knows. Um, we now have 58 members, seven of them are men. So just wanted to point that out. In providing voter registration events, we partner with community groups, such as nonprofit organizations, educational, educational places like the schools, local schools, and churches. So we go where the people are to make it easier for them to get ready to vote. This year, our state league has chosen to study the criminal justice system in Oklahoma. After careful review, a report will be prepared by the Oklahoma League, and it will be an it will be an advocacy of of certain steps that they think would be good to take. A lot of work needs to be done on the criminal justice system in Oklahoma. Um, so when our membership comes to a consensus on the recommendations for changes, we will actively advocate for those changes. We begin this process by educating ourselves and then providing programs for the community. We're planning a local program after the, at the beginning, sometime in the winter, and it will be on focused on the impact of incarceration. There are many aspects to this issue, including um, sentencing, heavy fines for people who have committed a crime, um, and charging them for their time when they're in jail, and it's just a lot of a lot of issues that we want to look at, and um, I'm pretty sure we're going to come up with some recommendations. Now, um, before I end, I want you to know that I have information in the back, on the table back there. Um, I have an example of the, of the Oklahoma Voter Guide. This is put out by the League. This is the 2020 issue, and um, the next, the new one is going to be coming out in first, and this is the first week in October. Um, yeah, first week in October. Um, it has, well, it's, as I say, it's nonpartisan. Um, we like to just provide information. I'm so crazy. just provide information so that people can make their own decisions about how they want to vote. I also have back there, uh, this is just, a, just an overview of voting in Oklahoma. It's called, your vote is your voice, get ready to be heard. I also have our membership forum. And even if you aren't thinking of joining the league, we'd love that. Um, it, has, it really gives good description of what we do in more detail. And this is just a little gem that the uh, Washington County Election Board put together. I just love it because it has a lot of information on a little piece of paper. And this is the first time they've done this and I think they're going to do it again. So it has information on how to contact, you know, everything about the election board and the website, the state website. So on the state website, you can make changes to your voter registration now. In order to register to vote, you do have to fill out a paper copy, which I have back there, and anybody who needs to do that, I can help them with that. Um, and then on the back, it has the date of the general election, uh, registration deadlines, um, absentee application information, and the days that they're having early voting. We're going to be having a Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday this time. They won't have this time back. And like I said, they're, they're not hiding their lead under a bushel here. They're not being subtle about this. Here she is in her younger days. In the <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's, that's my overview. So if you'd like to uh, register to vote or update your registration, I'll be back there at the end. Uh, now I want to shift and acknowledge two amazing league members. One is someone you know well, Celeste Berry. Where's Celeste? Back here. 
Okay, I know you all know her, but I can do um, And she is on our communications team. And the second is the other duo, uh, the second of the duo, it, and that's Vanessa Drummond. And Vanessa. And so Vanessa is going to be sharing um, a recent success story. It was a very exciting time. And I'll let her fill you in on the details. And then after she's through, if you have any questions for either of us, we'll be available. Nice job. Thank you very much, Tommy. And thank you all for having us here today. And um, I saw some of our for Connie. <laughs> So my name is Vanessa Drummond, and I started with the League of Women Voters, I don't know, probably 10, maybe more years ago than that. And the first thing, the reason I joined up was I wanted to help people register to vote. So my first couple experiences were just helping with voter registrations at um, Rogers State, did one at the library with Connie. And then uh, because I had kids in elementary and middle school, I thought, well, why don't I start working at the schools? So registering students at the high school kind of became my turf for a little while. Um, and it's really grown into a bigger project, which is awesome for our community to get more young people registered to vote and definitely more satisfying for, for the volunteers who are doing the, the registrations. So um, what we used to do was set up a booth next to the principal's office when you first walk into the high school. We'd have all of our voting materials, info on League of Women Voters, and we would really essentially just try to flag down kids who look like maybe they were 18. And if you think about it, there's not that many kids at the high school who are 18, especially at the beginning of their senior year. There's just a few. Um, so we might get a couple kids over, but really they seemed a little embarrassed, uh, disconnected. They didn't want so and so's mom calling them out and having to sign the, you know, sign a form. And they didn't really know what party they were, maybe, or they didn't, or they felt separated from the political process. And like that's not a thing I do. Um, so we kept at it for lots of years, and the turnout actually began to get worse because when they um, when the school built on the freshman academy, that meant all of the kind of the action shifted to the back of the building. So seniors would park at the back of the building, they'd leave for lunch, and we'd pretty much never see them up, up in the front of the office. So last year, I got connected with a new counselor named Marcy Beckley, who had, was such a fantastic counselor. After one year, she was moved up to be an assistant principal at the high school currently. She'd done a lot of voter registration at her previous schools, and she was just on fire to make this happen for Barlesville High School. So she really took off with the program. She got her leadership students to put together a table in the uh, cafeteria um, with banners and flags and you know popular music and a bullhorn. So they could shout out their friends. They knew who was already 18 years old and they could get a little peer pressure going to get the kids over to sign up to register to vote. Um, and so that first, uh, first round, which was in the fall of 2021, rather than like maybe a dozen or 20 registrations to vote, we got over 75. So that was just a huge um, accomplishment for us and a much, you know, much more satisfying use of time. And, and I love thinking about the kids who are now ready to go vote. Um, so at the same time as we were doing the registration in the cafeteria, which was truly handled all by students and counselors, uh, which which let, let us go volunteer for other things. Um, I had helped, well, originally Connie wanted to get into the government classes and tell students um, the history of League of Women Voters quite a bit like she did with you this evening. 
And we did that for a few years. And then uh, Roger Elmore helped put together a PowerPoint that kind of covered the basics so that people like me who weren't quite as informed could go in and talk about League of Women Voters um, with facts at our fingertips. And that was truly helpful for me to go in and have that type of PowerPoint to, to show the kids the history of women's suffrage, which I think most students um, and most adults today don't recognize how what a limited time women really have had the vote and how difficult it was to get that vote. Um, so I wasn't sure I was going to be able to go into all of the government classes. So I ended up doing a, a voiceover to the PowerPoint and I wrote up a, a, a typed up sheet of what which each PowerPoint was saying in case the voiceover didn't work, which was good because just like tonight, my, my <laughs> voiceover wasn't working and tonight my PowerPoint's not working either. But um, in the end run, it's worked out really well because now our government teachers have this resource, the PowerPoint that talks specifically about League of Women Voters nationally, um, women's struggle to get the vote, what's happening at the state level and how that applies to them and how they, um, Bartlesville residents, can register to vote. Uh, so it's been really successful on our local level and the state level League of Women Voters heard about that and wanted to adapt it for use in more schools so that you know more kids across the state will find it easier to vote, easier to learn about not taking our votes for granted and um, and it's been really thrilling to see it grow in that way. I wish I was able to show you some, but it um, specifically talks about the um, force feeding of women in prison, the, the burning of papers in front of the White House. And I didn't know as a kid how difficult it was. So. I'm really encouraged that the new government teacher will be showing that this year at the uh, Bartlesville High School, and we're hoping that it will go a lot farther than that as well. Um, on a separate note, today I received my absentee uh, voter ballot in the mail. So if that is kind of on people's minds, if you're going to be out of town or who knows, maybe you'll be sick. We never know. If you want to get an absentee ballot, you can register for that online and it will come to you. And I think this time around, you do need to get a, uh, what's it called? Notary. Thank you, a notary on your ballot, but it's well worth it to know that you got that taken care of, whether you're um, able to vote that day or not. So thank you for having us. Appreciate you. Guys. Um, I'm a notary. If you have an absentee ballot and you come to the next meeting and you want me to notarize your ballot for you, when you come to the next meeting, I'm happy to do that. So I'll make sure to bring my stamp in case any of you guys need that. Um, the next speaker, we have Laura. Yes. changes and it's I mean they're not familiar with the form so we just help them with the form um then, but we also have information there for them to look at without voting. I don't know if I answered your question. Well I would, I would say the funniest mistake people make especially high school students instead of counting they put country. Oh yeah. Wow. So that's one regular mistake. And then the other I would say is just forgetting to sign it. You know, they they get all the information down and then they just forget to sign their name. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to be knocking on doors 
We do voter registrations. Uh, we do them at the library here. We do them at various places. We've been, there were two places other events today. When we do them, uh, we scan them to make sure everything's okay. And then at the end of the day, we, or the next morning, um, we take them to the election board. So you don't have to mail it. You can mail it yourself if you want to. You just fold it and put a steam on it. Of things. They don't have to that's right that's right so like today i made a trip to the election board and held me there and um even if i only have a few i want to make sure and get them there as soon as possible and right here is maggie humble she's going to hate me for this but she is our team leader at bartles at the bartlesville library here just last week we had um, voter registration all day in the lobby and people have to walk right by us to come in or go to the bathroom. <laughs> We're very visible, and, and it's great to have our team leaders. It's really great. So we, we've been at Tri-County Tech already. Um, this morning, I just got to the meeting of the um, Veterans Connection, and we just, whoever asks us, we'll, we will do that. I think it's the 14th of October. Is that right? Okay. Um, but I would not want to wait to the very last minute to send in my application. Um, so we're going to be doing registrations for whoever wants them um, through the first week in October. So, yeah. yes. Can you say where the voter guide? Or where you'll be able to find them, the voting guide. Well, I'm happy to just contact me. I will get the supply for, for your group uh -huh. or individually. They will be in the library. They keep them in the reference area way in the back. And so I always bring them a big supply. Yeah. And I'll be in the Dewey Library too. And they're so always available I mean, online. <laughs> and they're available online. Yeah. Bonnie, do you remember the website where they're online? Is it? Well, on that little slip of paper, that okay. little slip of paper I was talking about, it's got the website. It's got the Oklahoma website, which you can go on and you can find. You can do so many things with it. Like when I voted absentee, I could go in there and I could see that they had received it. Um, you can change your party affiliation. You can change your address, you can make changes online. Uh, there's just a wealth of information on that site. And it's pretty easy to use, too. Yeah, if you just search OK Voter Portal, it'll take you right there. Right. OK, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, next, we have Lauren Rizell here running for city council in Ward 2. Now, city council is a nonpartisan race. This is not Republican or Democrat. It's just candidate versus candidate. So um, he asked if he could come speak to us, and we are always happy to entertain anyone who's willing to walk into a room with 50 Democrats. So, Do you mind if I pick this up? No, I can't say what I'm for you. Um, first, let me thank Eric for graciously allowing me to come and talk to y'all. Thank you all for letting me have some time today to talk to y'all. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, why I run, decided to run for city council, and what I came to do as a city council member, right? That's what you want to know. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Lauren Roselle. I am married to my best friend and my rock, Deanna Roselle. I was born and raised right here in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Grew up here, raised children here. Five generations of my family have lived right here in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So, I have three daughters and four grandchildren. Three of, two of my daughters still live here in Bartlesville. 
three of my grandchildren still live here in Barsville. So I know what it's like to grow up here in Barsville. I know what it's like to raise kids here in Barsville. And now I know what it's like to have grandkids in Barsville. <laughs> Back like grandkids are a special treat. Yeah. They're the reward you get for not killing your children. I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when my children got old, older, and they moved out of the house where they went off to college and started their own lives, I knew that there was a lot of people. I'm just walking in front of the projector. Sorry, no, I'm you're kidding. fine. It doesn't bother me a bit. It doesn't bother me a bit. So they went off and started their own lives and started having their own families. When I was growing up here, uh, there were struggles that my family went through. When I was raising kids, there were struggles that my family went through. And one of the special things about Bartlesville is that there was always people there to help, to support, to serve us, and to help us out. So I had some free time on my hands, so I decided to go out to the community and start giving back a little bit to the community. I started off volunteering at a few places. I've worked in the Westside Community Center as a volunteer. I volunteered at Agape Mission. I done a lot of volunteer work and as I started doing volunteer work I was started that I got asked to be more involved with some organization so I became a board of directors I started on the board of directors of the Barzwell Film Society because that was really near and dear to my heart because I when I was raising children I didn't always have money to take my kids to the movies or do something fun with them and I thought it was important to be able to do some free movies the families and kids to come out to that didn't cost anything. They got a bag of popcorn and watch a movie and have a night of entertainment. So I got involved with that. I uh, also got involved with the Barsville Police Department Foundation. I was a founding board member for Barsville Police Department Foundation. I wanted to make sure our officers were getting training, resources, equipment, everything they needed and were supported. I was uh, past president of the Barsville Denver Rotary Club. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud about at the Daybreak Rotary Club is we give away eight university scholarships. We rotate through two a year. But when I became president, I have a passion because, believe it or not, I only attended two years of college. And college just wasn't a path to success for me. So during my year, I started an initiative and instituted two vocational scholarships to be given away. At the same time, our university scholarships were being given away. I am really proud of that. It's one of the most, one of the things that I, that I really felt passionate about. There's a path to success for every kid, and sometimes that's not through university, but there's always a path to get a skill or a vocation and become part of our community. So I was really proud of doing that. Uh, I also served as the Convention and Visitors Bureau Board of Directors as their treasurer for a while. Whenever I started getting involved with the city and asking what I could do to help out, I think. Convention and Visitors Bureau brings a lot of revenue into our town. They help promote our town in a good light all over the nation. And we get a lot of revenue from it. So I wanted to pitch in and help there. And I was really proud to be the treasurer there for a while. I had to resign that position when I started running for city council because I didn't want it to be a conflict. But right now, I serve on the Barzo Regional United Way Board. Some of you may recognize me from some of my committees. I serve as the Community Investment Oversight Chair on the Board of Directors. What that means is all the uh, grant applications that our partner agencies submit to fund their programs. I coordinate about what, 14 different committees to review those applications for each of our partner agencies and um, look at them, evaluate them, ask questions of the agencies, and then ultimately recommend to the, to the United Ways how they would like to see those programs funded. So I take that recommendation back to the board and we, we get those funded. So that's a little bit about the work I did in my community, giving back, trying to serve them. Um, I really feel, you know, I decided to run for city council because when I had a problem or I wanted to know something about the city, the first call I always made was my city councilor. And he, Paul Sears, a friend of mine, loved him to death. Um, he was always there answering the phone. He'd give me the information. He'd put me in contact with somebody at the city that could help me out. He'd fix the problem sometimes for me. And I, all I had to do was call him. And the next day, I'd, yeah, the problem's fixed. Okay. And I thought, well, that's a great way to serve, to serve the community, to serve the people in my ward, to help them whenever they have a problem, answer a question, make sure they got all the information they want and they need. Because city council is, and city government is really important to us. 
because it's everything that affects us every day. The streets we drive on, clean water getting to our house, dirty water getting away from our house, trash getting picked up, police, fire, ambulance services. These are all things that we depend on every day that serve our community. So when I looked at it and I thought, I love Bartlesville. I've seen Bartlesville change so much from the time I was a kid. I grew up, you may not know, but I uh, grew up over here on the west side. I'm a west side kid. I grew up on Elm Street. I, was, I, I lived on Elm Street until I was 16 years old and went to Phillips Elementary School. Uh, I still drive by that place all the time and have some fond memories. Some not so good memories too, but fond memories for the most part. Um, so I had a passion for serving my community. I wanted to serve the people in my work. And I love my community and I want my community, community to keep growing. I want it to keep building. I want to keep improving Bartlesville. And I think if I'm elected, I can commit to saying, I serve my ward. I can represent everybody in Bartlesville. And that's what we need in government is somebody that represents everyone in the community. This, this should not be something we have to applaud. This should be something. That, and I, I discussed it a lot with my wife and she, her and I went back and forth on it. But when Paul Stewart decided he wasn't going to run again, I felt like it was the right time. I got a lot of encouragement from, this, from a lot of members in the next community. To encourage me to step up and run. Thought I had the skills, the knowledge, the experience to be able to do that. As I go around knocking on doors, I love meeting people, love hearing from people. I like helping solve. The other day, I worked from four neighbors right in a row in my neighborhood and said, These trees right here, cars are going to hit them. They, there's nothing to get done about it. I go away, I make a call, name this guy at the city, hey, can you help us out? And it's going to take 30 minutes to go do that. Can we, can we cut the red tape and just go do it? And say it was done. That's the way we should serve our community. That's the mic. So I'm going to stick around after the meeting. Um, I'd be glad to take questions right now, but I don't know what your time limits are or anything like that. But I'll stick around after the meeting. I'd love to meet each and every one of you, let you ask me questions if you want to one on one. But I commit to being the voice, your voice in city council represents everybody in our community and represents initiatives to keep improving bars. That's what I got. Thank you, Alana. You said a couple of questions. What's that have? So they may have questions. Yes. Ward two? Yes, Ward two. Yes. So I've been practicing this. I hope I get it right. right? <laughs> so if you start at Adams Boulevard between Silver Lake and 75, Right there before you get to the overpass of 75, you start at Adams Boulevard. Between Silver Lake and 75, you go all the way south from Adams Boulevard, all the way through Woodland, all the way past the car dealerships, all the way through Colonial, all the way to Rice Creek Road. And then when you get to No Water Road, jump over onto the east side of 75, and everything south from No Water Road to Rice Creek Road is part of Ward 2. So there's a big long strip from Adams on the west side of um, 75 going from between Silver Lake and 75 all the way south and then No Water Road all the way south to Rice Creek Road. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. That include Hillcrest Heights? So Hillcrest Heights, if I remember right, is on, is west of Silver Lake. We're, on, we're, we're adjacent to yeah, the Great Heights and Fourth Green. War three is what I was thinking. It's okay. it's west yeah, there, so it's too far west to be war two. Well, everybody, I think that's pretty hard to do. How do you feel like you can communicate? You know, I think we're all very challenged by that today. And see us that in our city to I get you, and I understand that, and I hear that a lot from constituents. So, I think I can't make other people behave, and you know, I can't control other people's behavior, right? So, what I can do is I can move into what my actions are going to be, right? So, I will keep people informed, and the way I do that is I've got a Facebook page. I'll publicize my phone number. I'll publicize my email address. It's on the cards that are back here. You can call me, talk to me anytime. 
But as I talk with my wife and everything, I think it's a great idea that I will commit that twice a year, I will publicize a location that I'm at. You can come talk to me. We can have a conversation. Other people will show up to that that you can have a conversation with too. We can all talk together. And when we talk person, person to person and not just keyboard warriors behind Facebook, that we treat each other as neighbors when we have a face-to-face -face conversation. So I will commit to facilitating a face-to-face -face conversation twice a year so anybody who wants to show up and talk about what's going on or what's happening. And I will listen to you. I will take all of that back and I will try to make this reasonable and responsible decision on the city council that I think moves our whole city forward. Does that answer your question? I, I yeah, my wife, uh, my wife says I'm an ideal <laughs> sometimes. That's exactly right. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned you were uh, grandfather. This is the greatest thing in the world. I, thank you. Uh, but you look too young to be retired. <laughs> I am not retired. So let me tell you a little bit about my work history with Connie Phillips, because that's probably something you know about me. And I skipped over that part of the speech, I guess. I'm not real good at this yet, so it's... So um, I uh, I had my first child when I was 21 years old. So <laughs> let's just start there. <laughs> my first job with what was then Phillips Petroleum Company was that I was the night shift cashier at the gas station that is on the corner of Madison and Pattis. It used to be owned by Phillips Petroleum. And I was the night shift cashier. I spent time behind that boat resistant cage cleaning Bring people up, make sure nobody robbed us. I did get robbed a couple times. But, and then I started having a family and I needed to earn money. And so I worked and got skills, got knowledge, tried to try to do the best job I can, had a good work ethic. 26 years later, going through all kinds of iterations from credit card, worked in credit card for a while. I managed some, some of the stores here in Barsville for a while. I uh, jumped over and did a help desk stint with the IT help desk. Got a lot of IT certifications and a lot of IT knowledge. Here in IT is a growing field, so I went and got some IT knowledge. And so now today, uh, 26 years later, I am a senior IT auditor. That means I travel around and make sure that every place is putting in good, good cybersecurity practices, making sure all of our stuff is secure from people getting up and trying to blow it up. We try to do that with them. But that's what I do now is I'm an auditor. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and one more sure, sure. Find, uh, your party affiliate. So I hesitate to talk about it, but I can't shy away from it. It's a nonpartisan race, and I'm not going to shy away from it. I am a registered Republican voter, but I'm a different breed of a registered Republican voter. I think a lot of people here in this room probably have heard me talk. And be honest with you, there was a couple of election cycles that probably ago that probably started my head spinning about how I, how we can do better. And I decided that if the only people running and the only people talking are a certain type of people, that's the type of people we're going to elect. So I am a big proponent of the community, always have been. And I said to myself, if you if you can't start representing the community and doing a better job in the community, making our community better, then we got no future in it. So start here to start serving the community. So yes, I am a registered Republican, but in city council, I like you. That's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. In city council, it's not about parts of politics. It's not about yeah. the again. We have to represent all of ours. We have to move forward. We have to keep the character of our city. We have to make sure that. We are advancing and putting in projects that the voters, every voter gets to say in this town, what do you vote for? What do you want to see? When you call me up, I'm going to advance those priorities. Yes, ma'am. follow on to that last question, could you differentiate yourself from the person you're running against right now? You can't answer. Well, let me say this. You will never, ever hear me say a bad word about anybody, let alone person from you, okay? Let's start with the conversation that it takes a desire to do something and serve a community in order for you to even step up and decide to run and put your name on the ballot. It takes courage to do that. 
I'm witness to it. I did it myself. It takes courage, okay? It comes from a place of service. Now, the question is, how does a person serve different, right? So I'm going to tell you about me. I am not going to talk to you about her, okay? <laughs> me, I will look and listen to everybody in the community. I will see what's best for everyone in the community. I will see what improves our local businesses, what grows our local businesses, what expands our tax base, what moves us forward, and what brings us together as a community. I will commit to being responsible, reasonable, and even-minded researching a subject and being able to move forward with something that benefits us all. That's all I can say. I will ne you'll never hear me say that word by my opponent. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, sorry, I'm taking so much time. Yes? Mm -hmm. One of the things that kept coming up over and over was health care. Yeah. And that was not at all put on the strategic plan. Okay. And so I'm very interested in what you thought of growing up, but I, I feel like health care is just so, the forefront and it kept coming up, but it was not in the plan. So I had a conversation with some of the city staff about that exact same thing. First of all, I'll say that. The fact that the city held six sessions to allow public come and have input on a strategic plan, I applaud them for it. I absolutely applaud them for it. More input from our citizens should be guiding our, our, our priorities rather than just a room full of people that decide. Okay. There's a lot of phases of this strategic plan, and I think you know we've got a good starting place. But if you look at healthcare, you're absolutely right. I struggle with healthcare here in Morris. Well, I've got issues, my wife has medical issues. Um, I struggle. I don't know, and I'm open to ideas about how the city can have an impact on healthcare availability here in Bartlesville. Um, I think the best thing we can do is to have an open line of communication with Ascension St. John about what the availability of healthcare is here in our city and to be pushing forward to them. We can't tell Ascension St. John what to do. We can't tell them what doctors to have here in Bartlesville. We can't. We can't dictate them. They're a private enterprise. They have their own strategic initiatives to make. But at the same time, I would think they want to be a partner in the city government and the city council here in our community. I would think they want to serve the interests of the community. What we can do is we can put facts and numbers in front of them and say, this is concerning. And when you deal with the city, we're going to ask you about this every time you come. Every time you come to us, we're going to talk about it. And that's, I, I'm open to ideas that other people have. I know there's a local group of citizens that have been pushing to try and get some changes into Ascension St. John. Uh, I don't know where that stands right now or if it's even being effective, but I think the city has to partner with a private group of citizens that's doing that, as well as have an open line of communication with Ascension St. John to try to fill the gaps in healthcare. I know that's not the answer you want. I know it's not, it's not the answer I want to give, but we need to create space for competition in this town, okay? And that means supporting and rolling out the red carpet to new businesses that want to come, uh, being supportive of our locally owned businesses so that they can grow, they can take the next step, and then and we build our revenue base, and we build our, our citizen base, which will attract competition. Yeah, just one more quick question. We have to move on. I will be around after, I promise. I will, but I'll take you. Well, what I was just going to say, I like the idea of attracting business. I hope you will be a strong supporter of our public school system. Because if we don't have a strong public school system here at across Oklahoma, business is going to exhaust. Oh, I, 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 can't, I can't disagree with that at all. In fact, whenever I talk to people about what they want, whenever they come and they look at Bartlesville, um, they look at the public school system. They have to. They must. And we have a great public school system. And Chuck McCauley and Marsville Public School Foundation, uh, Education Promise, all these people, they're working to build that. I think we have one of the best education systems in Oklahoma. Why would the city government ever get in the way? Get out of the way. Let them do it. They're doing a great job of it. Why would the city government ever get in the way? And I think you're absolutely right. 
Thank you. I'll be around afterwards. Thank you so much. Okay, we have uh, some representatives who want to speak really quickly with us about their campaigns. We've got Austin from the Kendra Horn uh, campaign. He's going to speak for five minutes. And then we have uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, like you said, my name is Austin Gibson. I am a Tulsa Field. Can everyone hear me first of all? Okay. I am the Tulsa Field organizer on Kendra Horn's campaign. And uh, we're super excited. I'm super excited about here in Barlesville for the second time this month, and uh, even more excited because of the big turnout. Uh, just for a county meeting, this is a room full of people. This is great. So I'm hoping that you guys are just as excited as we are for the cycle. So um, yeah, let's go. The uh, the big reason that I'm excited uh, getting to come to these meetings like this is because we have four really strong candidates on the ballot, four very strong candidates. Top of the ticket, we got Joy Hoffmeister running for governor. Uh, Next up for U.S. Senate, we have Kendra Warren and Madison Warren, two very strong female Democratic candidates. And then uh, further down the ticket, we have uh, Gina Nelson, who is going to beat Ryan Walker. I'm very excited about these races because, as we've discussed here, there are a lot of local issues that affect us every single day. And when, when we elect Kendra, Madison, Joy, and Gina, we're going to be a lot better off than we'll be electing the people I'm going to talk about. So um, my primary job and the primary reason that I got sent out here was because we need volunteers. Um, we're trying to do camp campus launches, door knocking out here in Bartlesville, but we need to know that people out here will show up. Um, so I have a sign-up list if you guys would like to uh, join our campaign and volunteer. I'm sure my friend Corey is going to get up here and ask the exact same thing. But um, regardless of who you come out and volunteer for, come on volunteer. Doesn't matter which campaign, just get involved. If you run for office, if you've ever been involved with a campaign, you know that it takes volunteers to win. No matter who it is running, no matter what party, you have to have people out there knocking doors. If you're not knocking doors, talk to your friends, talk to your family. Maybe you're a teacher, Democrat, your significant other, your spouse is a Republican. Say, hey, Gina Nelson is going to be the reason I keep my job. If Ryan Walters gets elected, he's going to try to shut down public schools. So you need to vote for my well-being. Uh, same thing with Kendra Warren, Madison Warren, Joy Hoffmeister. We'll be far better off with these strong four Democratic women in office. Um, so since we're pretty limited, I'll just open up to any questions. I don't really have... I can't really speak too much about what uh, the congressman would say. They're not related. Uh, they're not related at all. Sh shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. And uh, that's what that's why I'm getting sent out is for the exact answer. Uh, but no, they they're not related. Uh, some background on the congresswoman. Kendra Warren is from Chickasha, Oklahoma. As uh, a fifth generation Oklahoman, and uh, her parent, her grandparents. Were born in Alec, Oklahoma, which is just south of Oklahoma City. They uh, they lived in a dugout. So she comes from a family of Oklahomans, a family of grit, and uh, in 2018 shows showed us she can get things done. Her opponent is Mark Wayne Mullen, the farmer. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a, we get a lot of that going on the state. Um, uh, exactly. That's what that's what we keep hearing. Uh, yes, sir. Madison Horn is running against uh, Sarah Lansford. Um, but uh, Kendra Horn, her campaign is very excited. Uh, regardless of what you've seen in the news, you see on TV or Facebook, this campaign is exactly where it was in 2018 when it wound up being the underdog across the country that won. Kendra in 2018 flipped a safe red Republican seat to Democrat. And uh, based on the polling, we're in the exact same place that we were four years ago, and we're going to do it again. But it's going to take you guys volunteering. Don't, if you don't volunteer, it takes your dollars. A little bit of money goes a long way. Any other questions? Can Was that about the, the redistricting? But her district got changed to make it tougher this time. Sure. Um, Kendra Horn is running for U.S. Senate, so hers is a statewide race. Um, but the uh, district that she did 
represent in Oklahoma City was Oklahoma's fifth congressional district, which was primarily Oklahoma County, not too much of Edmond, but then it tailed off into uh, Potawatomi and Seminole counties, which were very rural counties. It was redistricted. They got rid of the they primarily got rid of those two rural areas, but gave her a good chunk of Edmond, where the Republican who wound up beating her represented them in the state Senate. So when they redistricted, she got like, I think the Republican candidate got like 20,000 votes out of it just from the redistricting, which took, which took place afterwards. But yeah, that's kind of been, yeah. I think we're going to go ahead and go ahead and pass on Joy Hoffmeister's campaign. My good friend, Corey Abernathy. I can even see. Hello, Washington County. How's it going? I remember that already. Roberta volunteered with us yeah. last weekend here in Bartlesville. It was a great weekend. Yeah, I got and I still got a few of those signs. Perfect. Yeah, people want. And I brought so many more signs. So if you don't have one in your yard, I would love it if you did by tomorrow because we brought a bunch. Um, and I hear we're opening a new office here in Washington County. So we're going to put a lot of them in there as well. If you have any friends or neighbors that want a yard sign, they'll be there. And so I don't know if you've seen the new polls, but we are so excited to announce that this race is winnable. This last poll that came out was KOCO 5 News in Oklahoma City, three points behind Governor Stitt. Three points. I need to go clear. I need to go clear. Sooner poll, a Republican pollster, had us one point behind Kevin Stitt. This is the race to watch. Gina Nelson is performing really well as well, and we're super excited because that is a super important race. You want to talk about public schools and the future of public education in Oklahoma, that is, that is an important race here. I will tell you, though, as governor, Julie would appoint, appoint the Board of Education. So governor is equally as important as the state superintendent when we're talking about public education in Oklahoma. So I, I, I came here with good news about polling. I also came here to talk to you about volunteer opportunities near you. We're coming back to Bartlesville this weekend. We're very fortunate that Eric has volunteered to lead that volunteer launch. So if you are, if you do have any free time this weekend, we would love it if you could come out and join us um, and knock on some of your neighbor's doors and, and present yourself as a volunteer for joy, concerned about public, school, public schools here in Oklahoma concerned about rural health care here in Bartlesville. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've heard, but Kevin Stitt has plans to privatize Sooner Care in the state of Oklahoma. 40% of recipients of Sooner Care are children. The, that, is, that is who's going to suffer. And it's rural communities like Bartlesville. It's rural communities like Elk City out west. It's rural communities like Tahlequah that re, uh, rely on our, our rural health uh, care providers here. And so um, how many of you have to go to Tulsa for your, for your doctor's appointments or the nearest metro area, Tulsa? Exactly. It shouldn't be that way. You should have that opportunity to go. You should have the opportunity here. And so I'm, really, I'm here to, to see all of you face to face. This is such a great turnout. Um, I had no idea Washington County was this fired up. Um, you couldn't get a room full of Democrats like this in Tulsa County. For Tulsa County, you cannot. Uh, you couldn't. For their week, their monthly meetings, Tulsa County is not like this. Oklahoma County is not like this. I told Eric that one. Well, I'm from Tulsa. I grew up on the opposite side of uh, Tulsa from a community called Bixby. There, Bixby is a lot like Bartlesville in that it seems like it's ruby red. It seems ruby red, but this race is proving all of that wrong. It's proving all of that wrong. We're in communities like Bixby. We're in communities like Bixby, we're in communities like Broken Arrow, we're in communities like Bartlesville, and we're hearing time and time again from level-headed Republicans, yes, they're still out there, there are a few out there still. Yeah. We're, we hear from level-headed Republicans all over the place, in Broken Arrow, in Bartlesville, in Elk City, in Lawton, all over the place. Joy, you're the first Democrat I'm ever going to vote for, because so much is on the line. And they're not pleased with our state leadership. And we're seeing that. And to win statewide in Oklahoma, just numbers wise, you have to have 20% of the Republican Party come with you to win. 
That's, that's a numbers game. And so that's why I'm here in Washington County, because we need to bring those margins. We need to, to, to push them closer together. We can't have, state can still win, Washington County can still be red, but we need it to be closer than it was in 2018 when Drew Edmondson won. Drew Edmondson lost by 12 points. This couple of these last polls had us within one. One and three points. This is such a winnable race. It's a very different environment than it was four years ago, and it's possible. Joy is the perfect candidate for this moment in time. So I'm here to ask for, you, for your time this weekend and for your time to, in the weekends to come before Election Day. We are 40 days away. And imagine the headlines, November 9th. When Oklahoma is blue, what would they say? What would the National Party say? With no help from the National Party at all, they, they're not helping us at all. It's Oklahomans fighting for Oklahoma. That's what this, that's what I'm here for. And so that's why I'm here asking for your time on your weekend. So thank you so much for having us. This has been such a pleasure. Bartlesville is an amazing community. I had no idea. I grew up, like I said, on the other side of the whole side, I didn't make it up this way too, too much. What a gorgeous community you have. So this is the perfect place to be. And yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Gosh, who's ready for Corey and Austin to run for office? Okay, Rebecca, I think we bring up our minutes. You know me, we are going to go warp speed here. I don't want you to be here all day. So um, we have our minutes from the last two meetings that we're just going to put up on the board. Um, I'm just going to ask for any objections. If you see something that is just wrong, call it out. If we get to the end and no one does, we're going to assume it's approved. Give them like 30 seconds. I'm going to let you breathe. <laughs> Rebecca did it, so it doesn't. It's, 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 it looked pretty good to me. Do you hear? Do, do I hear any objections? No. Okay, so then these are approved. Rebecca, the next one, please. These are August's meeting uh, minutes. We have to do both because Eric did bring the July minutes last. <laughs> Nobody heard you. You didn't have the mic. <laughs> Okay. Any objections to these minutes? No? Okay, we're going to assume that they are approved as well. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. We have a few activities coming up in the next couple months, um, not least of which is the election November 8th. We will have a watch party that night at the Haskell Loft downtown. Um, please plan to attend to join that with us. It's rare that the Democrats get together and celebrate. Um, and we may actually have some things to celebrate that night. So we're not going to miss that opportunity. Yeah, it, we will have something to celebrate. It will be better. Yes, you are right. Thank you. Um, so that's November 8th. That We will start that. I think at 6 o'clock is uh, the tentative start time for that. Um, if that changes, we'll let you know. Um, the Haskell Loft uh, downtown, and I'll get you the exact, it's on Frank Phillips downtown. And I'll get you the exact address um, as that approaches. On October the 18th, there will be a gubernatorial debate between Joy and Governor Stitt. Um, it will be streamed, and we will have a watch party at Crossing Second in the room back there. Um, and that will be, let's see here. I don't have time down here for that. I think we put that in the, the email, but I think it starts at 5.30. So we'll probably start 30 minutes before that. Um, but it'll be in the email. Uh, so please, again, plan to join us to watch that. I think it's only 45 minutes or an hour long, um, but it's nice to get together with some Democrats um, and support our candidates. So please plan to do that. Again, that's October the 18th at Crossing Second downtown, um, I think at 5.30. And then um, on October the 9th, which is next week, I think, um, Madison Horn and Brandon Wade will have a co meet and greet at Bambino's. Um, so your Matt or Madison Horn is running for Senate. Brandon Wade is running for 
City Council Ward 3 against Vice Mayor Jim Curd. So the two of them will be hosting a co-event together at Bambino's on October the 9th from 5 to 7. So please make an effort to go and see them. Um, I know a lot of you really like Madison Horn. She's wildly popular amongst uh, you guys. So um, that'll be a chance to go and see her. And then those of you who have time, please do sign up to come and knock doors for the Joy Hoffmeister campaign this Saturday. I'll be downtown passing out materials. Um, and then you'll go out in teams with a list of turf and knock some doors, come back and turn your stuff in, and, and you have defended democracy. There you go. I mean, it's that easy. Um, and while we're talking about that, I do want to encourage you, please, give of your time. And I'm not saying spend time on Facebook arguing with people. That doesn't help. It just doesn't help. When I say volunteer your time, I mean sign up with a campaign. I mean make phone calls, knock doors, put door hangers on doors without knocking them. Um, you take people to the polls. These are actions that actually make a difference. You posting a meme doesn't. Okay, it's 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 just a waste of energy. We get worked up, we get angry, and then we get really frustrated because we see very little gains. And in Oklahoma, it's easy to get frustrated as a, a Democrat. So um, do something productive this cycle. Give of your money, give of your time. I know things are tight. It'd be a hell of a lot more expensive to find a house or a home in a new community in another state when this one goes completely to pot. So it's time to give your money now before you have to move somewhere else. And I know we're, we're laughing like it's a joke. I have stopped house hunting in Oklahoma because I know what could happen. I am actively looking for a home outside of this state. And I know I am not the only college educated person doing that right now today. An entire generation is giving up on Oklahoma. If we don't defend this state this time, this time, it's, it's over, friends. It's over. There won't be public education. There won't be a healthcare system to fix. There won't be any of the social services that this state depends on. This is a poor state. There are a lot of people who depend on public assistance. And the Republicans are actively trying to destroy that system that we have set up to protect our friends and family from disaster. Bad things happen to good people all the time, and there is nothing wrong with needing a little bit of help. And the Democratic Party knows that. We understand that. We're ready to fund that help. It's important that we elect those people, though. Get involved. You have 40 days. The next time I see you, it will be October the 28th. We will have 10 days left. At that point, it may be a little too late. Now is the time, friends. Now is the time. We're so on Saturday. Yeah, so Saturday, um, yeah. Corey, when, where is it on Saturday? I think it's two shifts, nine o'clock and 11 o'clock, yeah. And don't don't think that I'm sitting up here asking you to volunteer a thousand hours. If you go do one thing, that is one more thing than most people will get out and do. Just one hour. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really easy job. Some people like knocking on doors and other people like driving them to knock on doors. I mean, if you're one of those people who are willing to drive someone to go knock on doors, we need everybody. This is literally an all hands on deck situation. Okay, we all share this democracy and we all share the responsibility. Okay. All right. I think that that may be it besides our offices. So, like, how much money do we have? Awesome. Okay. Um, Rebecca, you don't have a report. John doesn't have a report. I'm not going to have a report. I think we are done. Can I get a, a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yeah, a second. Right here. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Awesome. Democrats, have a great month. I'll see you guys in a few weeks.